Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Last week we questioned whether Theresa May could negotiate her emerging Brexit plan past the House of Commons. This week it seems she couldn't even get it past her own cabinet. The rock on which the plan has perished is the Irish border. Unless she agrees a particular backstop guarantee for Ireland, the European Union will not make a deal. If she agrees one, then she loses the support of the Democratic Unionists and much of the Conservative Party. As our show demonstrated last week, she's unlikely to find succour from any other benches in the Commons. In this programme, we hear again from the voices of Ireland. Is it possible to navigate a way forward, or will Ireland once again pose questions to which English politicians find there is no answer? But first, your tweets, your messages and your emails. First from Wendy, who says, randomly just caught Mike Galsworthy from Scientists for EU talking about the people's vote. He was great. Sign up to and support and march with us on the 20th if you can. And praise also for Mike from Eric who says, great interview on the show. Clear, concise and well answered. Measured and represented the anti-Brexit position superbly. Unlike the mostly incoherent pro-Brexit interviews I've heard. Paul, however, is not as pleased. He says, disgusting. Out means out. Not vote again till they get what they want. This shows clearly they're only out there for their own best interests. Lining their pockets is their agenda. Hmm. Contrarian also says, there already was a people's vote. They voted leave. Finally, Joe says, excellent programme with interesting discussions. It was especially good to hear the position of the DUP being stated. Now, in last week's show, top Democratic Unionist Sammy Wilson flung down the gauntlet to the Prime Minister in no uncertain terms. Sammy Wilson, Arlene Foster, in a, a memorable phrase, said the DUP have some blood red lines on Brexit. What are they? Well, the main line, that, and we have spelt this out from the very start of this process, is that the United Kingdom as a whole voted to leave the EU, and the United Kingdom as a whole will leave the EU. And if there are any attempts to leave Northern Ireland languishing in the stifling embrace of Brussels, then we will not be voting for any deal which uh, consists of an arrangement such as that. The Prime Minister, I think, dropped the ball at the very start because she accepted that there, there was a problem with the Irish border. Instead of kicking back and saying, there isn't a problem, there doesn't need to be a problem. We, have, we can find ways of monitoring trade across the border, collecting taxes if they have to be collected and everything else. Uh, but she, she didn't. And, of course, that's why we're now at the impasse that we are. And you look how many times the government has moved its negotiating position to accommodate the demands of Europe. And it's impossible then to do a deal with someone when you show such weakness. And, I mean, I think that the Prime Minister has at this stage now got to consider, does she dig her heels in? Does she even take back some of the compromises she's already offered to the EU and say, I'll tell you what, we're going to have a fight about this now. If you don't get this sorted out between now and March, you will finish up paying the consequences. You have German car makers will pay the consequences, French wine makers will pay the consequences, the Irish economy will pay the consequences because it will lose its main market in the GB. In GB. Now, we're, we're up for a fight. Fighting talk there from Sammy Wilson. Now, by one single independent unionist, all of Northern Ireland's MPs sitting in the Commons are democratic unionists. This is because it has been the long-standing tradition of Northern Ireland's second largest party, Sinn Féin, to abstain from sitting at Westminster, despite the election of seven MPs. However, there is no such bar on them taking their seats in the Doyle in Dublin or in the European Parliament. Speaking earlier this year to Alex, Sinn Féin leader Mary Lou Macdonald explained their stance on abstentionism at Westminster and their approach to Ireland in Europe. As a new leader of Sinn Féin, when you look at the... Uh the strong influence, the decisive position that the Democratic Unionists, with only a, a handful of MPs now have in the House of Commons, are you tempted to reverse the abstentionist policy and make a, a foray into the Palace of Westminster and uh, upset the Brexit apple cart? No. We don't take our seats. We continue in that tradition because for us, Irish political decisions uh, are to be made rightfully in Ireland for Irish people. 30 years of troubles, 20 years of peace. But of course now a, a Brexit process, which some people believe is a fundamental danger to the, the peace process. How do you evaluate that danger? 
Brexit and the Good Friday Agreement are mutually incompatible. You cannot have Brexit, you cannot have a forcing of the North of Ireland out of the European Union on the one hand and still claim to honour in word and spirit and letter the Good Friday Agreement. It is, in our view, as stark as that. And I listen to Theresa May and I listen to others uh, from the English Tories saying that don't worry about the border in Ireland, Ireland will be fine on the one hand and then insisting that Britain will leave the customs union, leave the single market and so on. And of course the reality is that those two positions are completely at odds with each other. I think the Tories have played a very dangerous game. No way can Ireland or should Ireland or will Ireland be the collateral damage in the midst of all of that. Um, the idea of reimposing a border on the island is not just economically disruptive, it potentially jeopardises the entire political infrastructure of the Good Friday Agreement. The executive itself in the North and the Assembly, the Northern institutions, are built on, uh, are premised on the notion of European standards and regulations and law. So this is a big problem for us. Brexit is a disaster. And I would not say that the DUP have what I, what I would understand or consider to be a position of huge strength. I think they, they find themselves at a particular moment in time with a particular mathematical uh, relationship. Now, don't get me wrong, I think this uh, confidence and supply arrangement between the Tories and the DUP is, is wrong. I think it absolutely compromises the British government's claims to impartiality or independence. I, I think it is highly problematic from that point of view. So what are the other political consequences of, of, of Brexit? There is provision, of course, within the Peace Accords for a, a referendum in Northern Ireland under certain circumstances and Irish unity. Is it your opinion that Brexit Britain makes such a referendum very likely or indeed inevitable at some stage? I think it demonstrated very clearly just how vulnerable the north of Ireland is in the, within the union. Because let's face it, the people in the north voted to stay. And yet that could be totally disregarded and, and overruled. A scenario where investment into Ireland the economic activity right across the, the island. P people born on the island of Ireland um, who take for granted the fact that they can do simple things like travel throughout Europe. Like Europe is people's hinterland now. People have grown up with a access for education, for work and so on. But even unionist politicians are advising uh, people to, to get Irish passports. Well, precisely, yes, precisely. Because these are things that people value. I wouldn't go so far as to say that it makes Irish unity inevitable, but I certainly think it underscores the common sense of a united Ireland, the common sense of actually managing our own political affairs and not allowing other forces beyond you to actually overrule and override decisions, democratic decisions made by the people. I think it, 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 it sets that out very clearly. I was speaking to Mary Lou Macdonald in Dublin earlier this year, but this week she was back in front of the House of Commons delivering a press briefing after a meeting with the Prime Minister. She turned to the subject that one unintended consequence of a no-deal Brexit could be to provoke the conditions for a poll in Irish unity in Northern Ireland. I have to say, uh, Theresa May took to her feet really to say nothing terribly new. I think it's worth remembering that uh, from the outset when the Article 50 process was triggered and when the negotiations started, everybody accepted, including the British government, that there was a particular case to be made for Ireland, that there is a particularity about the border, about the interests of Ireland north and south, and that there was a common and shared objective to protect the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts to avoid any hardening of the border and to ensure no diminution of citizens' rights. Mrs May signed on for that. 
I'm very unhappy to record that since that time the British government have rowed back on those commitments and we can only surmise that that is on the say-so of the DUP, a party who do not represent or articulate the view of the majority of people in the north of Ireland who voted to remain. So we've heard uh, this evening uh, Mrs May talk about uh, a temporary backstop, a temporary answer. Uh, we need to be absolutely clear that Brexit itself is not a, a transitory event. The consequences of it will be long uh, and will be deep. And so the backstop arrangement, the answers to the questions for Ireland have to be enduring. The idea of a time-bound or a temporary little arrangement simply will not cut the mustard. And if Mrs May uh, hitches her wagon to the most extreme Brexiteers, including uh, the DUP, I think that history will judge her very badly. We're now at crunch time. These are times of history. These are times of big decision. And uh, it would not be uh, acceptable for Mrs May to act purely for political expediency, whether that's to hold her government or her party together. What's required now from her is big leadership, uh, long-term leadership. She has to do the right thing by Ireland, and nothing short of that will suffice. And let me also say this to, to those of a unionist persuasion who perhaps might wish for a hard Brexit in the misguided belief that that somehow resolves the issue of the border in Ireland. Let me say this, if there is a crash, if there is a hard Brexit, well then there will be an immediate demand for a referendum on Irish unity. It, it would not be uh, in any way acceptable that all of the damage of a hard Brexit be visited on the island of Ireland and for the British government to accept uh, Ireland, North and South, to simply take that on the chin and be philosophical about it. So if there is a section of unionism, and I've heard this articulated very irresponsibly by some who believe that actually a hard Brexit is a good day out for the union, I would say to them, think again, think long and think hard. It's clear that both Sinn Féin and the DUP mean business in terms of this Brexit struggle. So join us after the break for an update on the latest thinking from the Democratic Unionist Party. Having scuppered last week's Downing Street plan, is there anything on which they are prepared to settle? Welcome back. After the dramatic intervention of the DUP last week, threatening, if necessary, to vote down the government's budget next month, there followed a weekend of confusion and threatened resignations. And not just from the usual Brexit suspects, but from some previously considered loyal to the Prime Minister. In a statement on Monday, Theresa May tried to buy time, still under pressure from all sides, but in particular from the DUP. Would she confirm its single market and customs union, the UK leaving the EU together with no part hived off either in the single market or customs union differences. When uh, the UK leaves the United King uh, when the UK leaves the European Union, it will be the UK that leaves the European Union. We will be leaving uh, the European Union together. I'm very clear there should be no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. But as we've put forward proposals, we can deliver on that and maintain the integrity of our union. And of course, what we're looking at in relation to the uh, and we made that very clear when the European Union made their proposal that would effectively have carved Northern Ireland away from uh, the rest of the United Kingdom in their backstop proposal. It's precisely because we cannot accept their backstop to a backstop because they continue to want to, uh, to want to see that. In fact, what we want to see in a backstop is a situation where Northern Ireland businesses can both export freely to the Great Britain and to the European Union. Actually, that would be a good position for the Northern Ireland businesses. Alex spoke to senior DUP MP Jim Shannon to have his assessment on whether the crisis has passed for now. Jim Shannon, can I take you back to last December when the Democrat Unionist Party warned the Prime Minister of the dangers of the so-called backstop? Mm -hmm. Do you believe this last week these chickens have come home to roost for Downing Street? Uh, it's disappointing that we are where we are because we felt that last uh, December we had made our position very, very clear. Uh, unfortunately, we've had a lot of smoking mirrors, we've had a lot of, uh, of discussions with uh, uh, rumours and, 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 uh, 
uh, other allegations and, and stories put forward. But the things have been very clear. Uh, this week has been a difficult week. Uh, this week now we're coming into probably will be the culmination of, of where we are. Uh, we're not happy with where the direction that the Prime Minister is indicating uh, at this moment in time. And we're very clear where we are, that we, we are opposing totally the backstop. We want to be treated. Northern Ireland, the same as the United Kingdom, everybody else, no difference. Well, the, the threat that emerged, or the declaration from the DUP, that you would be prepared to withdraw support from the Chancellor's budget, mm -hmm. was that a serious intent, or was that part of a political negotiation? Um, I, w I would say it was serious because uh, we were dead mad last week. I was mad as a hatter, uh, told Nigel that last week. Uh, the rest is when we had our group meeting uh, to discuss where we did on the agricultural this is bill. Nigel Dodds, Nigel the Dodge, DUP yeah, leader. Yeah, the DUP leader. We met as a group last week. We, we uh, took a, a decision to abstain on the agricultural bill, uh, not because we were against the bill as such, uh, but because we, we needed to tell the government. And we didn't tell them in advance, we just did it. We're, we're very clear when it comes to the budget that we are prepared to push that button. Uh, if we find that this is going in the wrong direction, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, uh, an idle threat. It's a fact uh, that we, that we can and we will do it if necessary. Now, Sammy Wilson, your colleague, yeah, yeah. told us last week on this program that, in his opinion, the prime minister should tear everything up and start again. Would that be your advice as well? Um, well, I would suggest to the Prime Minister that uh, if she cannot get a deal with uh, Michel Barnier and the rest of the EU, then we only have one option, and that one option, unfortunately, it's not the one I want to see. I'd rather have a deal. Uh, but if we can't get a deal, then we, we go out and leave the EU and that we, don't have a no, we have a no-deal Brexit. Now, Northern Ireland as a whole, despite the DUP's opposition, voted for Remain. Now, the other parties in Northern Ireland are not represented in the House of Commons, either because you had knocked them out or, in the case of Sinn Féin, they pursue an abstentionist mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. But doesn't that give you a responsibility to represent all of the opinion of Northern Ireland, not just the DUP position, which was only supported by a minority, a sizable minority, mm -hmm. but still a minority. Uh, and, and, and my constituency, Alex, just to, to make it clear, my constituency voted 54, 46 to leave. Uh, I never doubted that would be the issue because of a strong farming and a strong fishing community, and, and their voices were clear. Uh, yeah, it is true that the, that the, that the majority of Northern Ireland uh, did vote to, to, to remain. But remember that that vote is the whole of the United Kingdom. I've said this to all the constituents over the last period of time. The vote wasn't a Northern Ireland regional vote. It wasn't a, a vote that was regionally taken anywhere else. It was a United Kingdom of, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland vote. So therefore, the vote that was taken has to be taken in totality for the whole of the United Kingdom. And that's very clear. It was a vote to leave. So how do we, how do we move forward? Some of my colleagues uh, and, and some of my friends would be of the opinion that we should be trying to get a deal with the EU. That's what I want the Prime Minister to do. That's what my party leader, Arlene Foster, and Nigel Dodds here, our, our uh, parliamentary leader, wants us to do. But if we can't get that, then we have to look at the, the, the consequences. The consequences are clear. And it won't be us that will suffer. It will be the EU will suffer as well. So let's look at getting a deal that can bring a conclusion, successful conclusion, unless there's some realism in those talks and discussions. And finally, Jim Shannon, is part of Downing Street's complacency, perhaps complacency yeah. they've been shocked out of over the last few days, about the DUP, is that they believe you wouldn't countenance a general election and a potential Jeremy Corbyn government. Now, for you who's been known to be on the left of your party, perhaps that's not too bad a thing, but for many of your colleagues that would be the anathema. Is that the reason why the government up until now have been complacent about the attitude of the Democratic Unionist Party? I'm, I'm not sure um, how government have got themselves in the mucks that they're in at this moment in time. But uh, as I said uh, to someone, one of my friends last week, we're not afraid of elections. DUP never have been. Uh, we'll take our mandate to the people and we'll let the people decide. Uh, it would be better if there wasn't an election, let's be honest. I don't think there's any appetite in the House from either side, with a few exceptions to, to the... I, I certainly uh, don't have any wish to see Jeremy Corbyn in, in, in a position of power, be it Prime Minister or in government, whatever it may be. Um, I believe uh, the um, Prime Minister at this moment in time, if she looks at where she's going and plots that course strategically and carefully in, in cooperation with the DUP, I think we can find a way forward. But she's got to respect us, she's got to trust us, and she's got to build that trust. Jim Shannon, thank, thank you, very you very much. much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. To provide an analysis of the week where Ireland has once again dominated the Brexit burrach, Alex spoke to John Tong, 
Professor of British and Irish Politics at the University of Liverpool. John, welcome back to the Alex Salmon Show. Pleasure. Now, some people will be quite surprised by the, the vehemence by which the Democratic Unionist Party state their position. I mean, Arlene Foster with Michelle Barnier last week, Sammy Wilson on this programme last week, or even Nigel Dodds in the, in the Commons with the Prime Minister on Monday. What lies behind that strong statement of position? I don't think we should be surprised. The DUP has always been an anti-European Union party and the DUP has always believed that Northern Ireland must be an integral part of the United Kingdom in constitutional and economic terms. Of course the DUP supports divergence in other aspects on issues like same-sex marriage and abortion. But in constitutional terms the DUP fears that anything that aligns Northern Ireland more closely with the EU, and in this case the Republic of Ireland, given what's proposed in respect to the border, that's the slippery slope to United Ireland. And the DUP, as the hardline Unionist party that it is, will not countenance anything like that. Despite the fact that Northern Ireland voted as a whole in favour of Remain, the DUP don't seem to have tempered their policy against the European Union at all, nor do they seem frightened of another general election. They're certainly not frightened of an election because in the hermetically sealed boxes that are Northern Ireland's uh, ethnic blocs, the DUP will still be top dog amongst Unis if there was to be a general election tomorrow. The DUP would probably return with 10 seats, possibly 11 seats. So the DUP certainly don't fear a general election. Secondly, the outcome of a general election may well be a hung parliament again, so the DUP could potentially uh, still have influence, certainly if the Conservatives were the largest party. Uh, and the DUP aren't bluffing when they say they will vote things down like a, a budget, a Conservative budget. I think that's part of the reason that Theresa May won't conclude any sort of agreement with the EU anyway. A government that cannot get its budget through the House of Commons is frankly a government paralysed. You can't do anything. You can't approve any expenditure. You can't even approve payments to the European Union that will form part of the divorce settlement. So the DUP's position is, is very, very important indeed. The only way they could be bypassed would be if Theresa May could come up with a leave package that attracted the support of Labour MPs on the opposite side. There was a, a moment, just a moment, in the Prime Minister's statement last Monday where she seemed to suggest to the DUP that they could actually end up in a preferential position to the rest of the United Kingdom with full free trade with the UK market and preferential access to the European market. But that's not something, even a preferential position, that the DUP might be interested in. Northern Ireland could actually enjoy boom time uh, if the, the DUP would relent on this position. But the DUP have this almost paranoid fear, which, you know, admittedly is partly a consequence of the legacy of the Troubles, that they are being, you know, the, the, the deeds of transfer uh, uh, are being placed upon them to force them ever closer to the Irish Republic and eventually United Ireland, that they're being shipped out of the United Kingdom if Theresa May goes down the road that she has tentatively proposed and certainly hinted at to Nigel Dodds in her statement uh, last Monday. So, so thinking about this dual alliance developing between the Scottish Conservatives and the Democratic Unionist Party, would it be fair to say that the Scottish Conservatives and the DUP have in common that they will never, never, never accept economic preferment because they fear the political consequences to the Union. Yes, constitutional politics trump everything else uh, for both of those parties. The DUP talks about Northern Ireland's position in the United Kingdom being threatened on an almost daily basis. Uh, Ruth Davidson says she never wants to hear anything more uh, about an independence referendum, but she daily talks about constitutional politics you know, and, and has tried to mobilise the anti-independence vote behind her party. Thinking about the developments, or lack of them, from a, a Sinn Féin perspective, the, the second largest party in Northern Ireland, the third largest party in the Irish Republic, uh, are people in Sinn Féin uh, at all jealous at the influence that the DUP have at Westminster, which they can never have as an abstentionist party, or do they think that the way things are, are this logjam might work to the, the benefit of their ambitions for a united Ireland? Sinn Féin's been hugely critical of the DUP's relationship with the Conservatives at Westminster. They argue it's a partisan relationship which isn't uh, any good for the people of Northern Ireland as a, as a whole and it's to the detriment of the nationalist community. 
Yes, there have been voices that have said, why don't, to Sinn Féin, why don't you take your seats at Westminster, your, your, your seven seats to which you're entitled, on, on the basis of Sinn Féin's mandate. But it's too big a step for Sinn Féin to swear an oath of allegiance to a British monarch. It would be very hypocritical of Sinn Féin to do that. It would also be very divisive within Sinn Féin. You need a two-thirds majority within the party for them to take their seats. So it certainly isn't going to happen in, in the short and medium terms if it ever happens. Professor John Tong, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. In the run-up to last Christmas, Theresa May thought she had cracked the first phase of the Brexit negotiations, only to be pulled up short by her flag of convenience friends in the DUP. It is said that she ignored the advice of her then Brexit Secretary David Davis by keeping her allies out of the loop until the very last minute. The ghost of Christmas past let the Prime Minister off with a humiliating delay, a warning and some ambiguous words on a backstop. It seems unlikely that the ghost of Christmas present will let her off so lightly. The images presented to the Prime Minister for this winter are not appealing. There is no Commons majority for the Chequers fudge or anything that resembles it. The only way to avoid the unpalatable choice between an Irish border and an Irish sea border is to stay in the single market and the customs union. Ironically, there may be a parliamentary majority for this, but it would split the Conservative Party asunder. Meanwhile, to pursue a basic trade deal or Canada Plus might itself go down to defeat in the Commons, and it would represent the final political humiliation of facing defeat on someone else's policy. Conservative MPs might conclude if that's to be the direction of approach, it would be better advocated by someone who actually believes in it. For Theresa May trapped between a Brussels backstop and some Northern Irish hard cases, life is far from easy. She would be forgiven for believing that things could hardly be more difficult. However, she should remember that the most terrifying spectre in the Dickensian story is not the ghost of Christmas past or present, but the spirit of what is yet to come. Now, if that wasn't enough for the embattled Prime Minister, in next week's show we examine whether there is a further looming Celtic problem for Theresa May. Is the good ship Brexit now steaming towards a Scottish iceberg in the form of a legal case which could blow the European debate wide open? I think the European Reform Group will be uh, choking on their G&Ts. Not only is it their worst nightmare that the European court that they so despise uh, has delivered it, but it's been brought there by the jocks. Well, it's certainly all kicking off on Brexit. We'll see you next week. And so it's goodbye for now. <laughs>